Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading property experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, and Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the 2014 and 2015 Property Investment Advisors of the Year. All right, folks, you're on The Property Couch each week. Ben and I bring you the Insider's Guide to Property Finance, Money Management. Welcome to week two of the wonderful year of 2018, mate. How's week two treating you? Yeah, pretty good. Yeah? Pretty good. These weeks go quick. They're flying, aren't they? It's already up to week two. Felt like the last podcast was only minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it uh, was a good week last week, wasn't it, where we had... Summer series. The Just, summer oof, series. Maybe it's the, maybe it's the heat. Mm. So, mate, exciting time of the year mm-hmm. now that you talk about the heat. Yeah. Because uh, Ashes, cricket. Yes. We just exp- had the Sydney test. That was awesome. <laughs> hey, how'd you think about that? And we are coming up to the Australian Open Tennis. We are. Which absolutely love this time of year with the Open Tennis. So what did I think about the quiz, the Sydney test? Mm. No, I didn't say that. I knew you wouldn't have anything to contribute. Oh. It would be like you'd never watched it. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, of course, Australia Day is coming up, which is a big milestone in the buyer's agent's calendar because then finally the real estate agents come back to work. They come back to work. The weekend and after the Australia starts Day. starts to extend. Mm, but uh, question for the listeners. Yes. How are those New Year's resolutions? Yeah. Good question. Car park's always full in January at the gym. Yeah. But not so full in February. No. So uh, if you... Let's hope you're sticking to them. Mm, well, uh, my mindset minute today, Ben, yes. is uh, Tony Robbins. Have you, have you ever walked on fire with Tony? Mate, I've never done the And no ambition walking. to do that? No, not to say never. We know Stiggy because uh, she, she, I asked her in America, are you into personal development? She said no. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember? No. She, but, you know, but she's learning. She's she, living she, she's an osmosisly she's, through she, us. Is that the word? Osmosis? She's um, just in time rather than just in case. Yeah. So, well, no, she's more than that. She she manages the manager. Mm. She's pretty good at keeping us. Let's be honest, on there's track. not too many people that could work with you and I oh. under these circumstances. No, not for what we pay her. No, <laughs> no. We, what we pay her? We pay her. All right. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. Like she goes, not for this. It's for the love of the job. Mm. We pay her in smiles. We'll move. So, on. but yeah, no. Ivis is a very strong personal developer. She doesn't feel like she needs to get it out of a book. She just feels like she's got this yep. internal knowing. So yep. she yep, she she knows it all. How so, can you improve on perfection, right, Ivers? <laughs> uh, delirious now. <laughs> so uh, mine is a Tony Robbins quote. I like Tony. The quality of our life is determined by the quality of the questions we ask ourselves, Ben. Have you ever thought about that? Hundred percent. Think about, about these ones. How can I learn from this? How have other people succeeded? How can I break this down into manageable chunks? Who can I learn from or ask for advice? Then they go on. So the quality of our life is determined by the quality of the questions we ask ourselves. The we ask ourselves bit there, Bryce. Mm. Very, very important. Very, very important. I like that a lot. (laughs) That was great. You did like that, didn't you? So central theme today, Ben, summer series part two, best of... Best of? Yeah. Pure gold. Some of our early episodes, which some of our newer listeners might not have actually gone that far back. As much as we say, rewind, go stop, pause, go to part one, go at one and a half speed, listen to them all because they all build on. Some people just don't have the time, Ben. That's all right. So we're We're just summarising some of the best of from our early interviews. Beautiful. And today, we have got a very good lineup. Do you want to sort of... Well, sneak into them, Ben? I mean, we have Jane Slacksmith coming up. We've got Damo Collins. Veronica Morgan, Stuart Wimes, and Dr. Andrew. Don't forget the doctor. Wilson. Don't forget the doctor. So we We have got got some gold. So we are not going to waste any more time. We are going to cut straight to it, Ivis. Let's go. from the renovation queen, Jane Schlack-Smith. You know, I have my Trident strategy that is pretty much the the foundation to everything that that I teach. And it comes from my low risk investing, whereas I don't want to make a mistake. So if I just, you know, most people have the hope strategy. Yeah. I'm going to invest and hope I've got it right. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, for me, it's like, oh, look, I know I have an engineer's brain. I know that I logically step it through. If I can take what I know and make into a simple um, message that people can follow. And you know, the Trident strategy is three ways to make money. So if you get it wrong in one way, you know, you've got two to fall back on. And for me, that just makes sense. Well, tell us about it. Tell tell us us about it. (laughs) The secret Trident strategy. (laughs) Um, Well, first of all, it's making money in the short term by actually understanding the market and buying below the market. So you've got some equity gains straight up. Yep. 
not always easy in a fast moving market. Correct. And potentially the one of the three that you'd get give away. Mm, yeah. But there is still opportunity and in fast moving markets we've all bought where people have said there's no way to buy below the market. So we know it happens. Yep. And yep. especially with your buyers agents, you know, in power wealth, you'd be seeing this every day with off market sales. So yep. you know, it does happen. And the second way is I always buy a property with renovation potential. So I want to add equity. Yep. So it's so important to me that I have that capacity. Now, if I'm uh, not a renovator, then that's okay. Having the ability to add that later is okay as well. And as yep. the book says, you know, two properties, one renovation, a million bucks in the bank. That's around, you know, someone buying a property this year. In three years' time, when there's equity gain, they renovate it. Yep. In five years' time, they buy a second property. And that's it. Five years of hard work or future tax towards your, your yeah. financial future. Well, 15 years, sell them a million bucks in the bank. Brilliant. Oh, the third one. Yes. <laughs> it's a big secret. Gee, dun, you want to hear dun. this nowhere else. Dun, dun, <laughs> Buy yeah. in a good location oh, yeah, with right. capital growth. Oh, and there potential. we go. <laughs> That's it. You know, big secret reveal. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. We, we all know that. Buy in a good yeah. area with good potential capital growth. So you've got three ways to make money. Yeah, yeah. I, I look, I like them. I mean, the, as you say, the biggest one, the challenging one is the below market one. Mm -hmm. And that's because you could potentially get into an area where it doesn't fire. Yep. And so you can be sitting on something that doesn't have the growth and hence... Research, 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 isn't it? It all comes down to knowing where to buy. And, you know, location for me is the absolute key. Yep. And uh, the research people, you know, they buy around the corner because <laughs> yeah, oh, it's convenient. <laughs> well, they understand it. So they, they think that it, oh, I've done the research, I've yeah. been around the block and, you know, I've, not, I've grown up here. I know there's a, you know, there's a safe way down the road and there's, you know. Nice safe a, area, yeah, no exactly. one's been to my car. Bus Route 38 goes through here, you know, that sort of goes somewhere. You know? and, and that's when I challenge people to tell me they know the area. I'm like, okay, so what is the vacancy rate? What's the percentage of renters? What's the typical house? What's the typical demographic? What's the infrastructure changes? You know, what are the what's the yield? What's last year's median price? What's this year's? And you, they're like... Uh, it's still a really good area. I'm yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Go and do that research. It's, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all it's all about uh, getting the right location in my mind and to the success that people can have in property investing and you know the core message to me is do the research. Yeah. With the renovation and the amount of renovation you do and the students that you have, mm. can you uh, you know without notice what where do most people incorrectly spend their mm. renovation funds? Even once you've taught them the principles and the frameworks and these are what you need to do, mm -hmm. then they go out and they're live and they're on their own. Mm. Where where are they spending the cash? Is that the you know, the emotional purchase yeah. on the tiles. Well, it's, it's good because I, um, in our private Facebook group, I get to see people putting their projects up and or they'll float them beforehand and say, what do you think? And so we can kind of steer them away before they make these mistakes. But often what happens is it's something they couldn't do in their own home. Hmm. And they're like, oh, I've always wanted the, no, no, you know, no. double-headed shower. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> really? You know, in Camden, in our <laughs> suburbs of, of, of Sydney, not Mirror that appropriate. Oh, no, yeah. no, no. <laughs> the people who rent it are going to say, oh, honey, we've made it. Yeah, yeah. Double-head showers yeah. in here. This and, is and so, yeah, honey, move shower. <laughs> <laughs> they're actually putting, you know, um, they're putting their own wish list on the specifications that should be, which is a numbers, it's a complete numbers uh, game, mm -hmm. if we call it a game the renovation process of understanding exactly how much it's going to cost, how much it's going to be worth at the end. They don't do that research, so they kind of get going and go, oh, I've kind of gone over budget. Oh, I didn't have a budget. So, you know, that discipline of having the budget, having the time frame, absolutely knowing what the end value is before they even buy the property, mm. and then being very clear on um, what they're going to do. They're going to renovate fit for that market, which means you need to know what the market is. Mm. Is it a three bedroom with a board house with Lemonex or Scissorstone bench tops? And so they don't overcapitalize and they don't put their own um, taste and emotion into it. So it, it's the numbers only. And we're usually talking flipping versus buy and hold. So okay. flipping is buy, renovate, sell. So there's a number of different strategies. So first and foremost, you need to determine what strategy you're after before you buy. Because if you're buying a flipping property, which is not being rude, yeah, yeah, property yeah. to flip, <laughs> <laughs> a flipping, your target market is owner occupiers. Mm. Now, the census data allows us to find what streets the owner occupiers want to uh, live in. So you're buying properties in those streets. If you want to target the buy, renovate, hold, there's streets where renovators, where so renters live, you target those streets. So, you know, you need to be very clear on your strategy, first of all. Once you have the strategy, 
it helps you to determine where you buy. So then you, you get the location and do that analysis. And then you get down to the, is there the pricing disparity? Because sometimes you just have to give up on a suburb because the differential will not make you the profit that you want. Mm. And then once you find the property that allows you to do that, you know, a rule of thumb is 10% of the value of the property you'd spend on a cosmetic renovation. Having said that, I went and did a refresh uh, renovation last year of one of my existing properties. It was valued at 820. I did a $35,000 renovation. Six weeks later, it was valued at 920. You know, so I knew it was going to be valued at 920 because I did six or seven comparable sales to say if I renovate up to this standard, what will it be worth? Mm. And if the profit's not in there, you don't do it. Mm. You know, yep. Yep. so I think um, for people who don't have the experience it's it's a process and it's a you know if it was easy everyone would do it yes we've said that a few times but it's and not we, easy we talk a lot about process in this mm. in, on this podcast and yep. and it's the same thing when you take your clients through that that's exactly what you're doing this is the framework this is the this is the course material this is exactly what you should follow try not to go outside of those because there's reasons for that um, you know, but I'm not going to document everyone in the next hundred pages. But just stay within the frameworks, follow those systems and processes, and don't get excited by the end result. The end result comes from the process that you deliver. Have you seen with the students any uh, common uh, human traits that the successful ones do versus the ones who whose ambition exceeds their ability? It's interesting because I have uh, I have kind of like a. Uh, exercise that the students go through which is a risk profile of different in types of property investment so off the plan subdivision renovating granny flats you know Great. NRAS home blah blah but the thing is what it comes down to is that you have to understand your own risk appetite mm. and you know you I reduce risk so as I said risk assessments to me is about likelihood and consequence so yep. I work out the likelihood of something going wrong and then what's the consequence what's the likelihood I'm going to have a tenant so I've got 20 tenants at the moment what's the likelihood that one of my tenants will damage a property kind of high mm. right so how do I minimize that risk I have landlords insurance tick is this a risk that's acceptable to me now yes I'll move on Whereas for renovation, you know, people might look at this and risk and say, what's the risk that I could get it wrong well, and lose money on this? Well, the risk's quite high because we hear about successful people, but we all know a lot of people overcapitalize. Yeah. And, and especially for their homes as well. Like these, the oh, techniques I'm we have is for homes as well as for investment. Hand up in this latest renovation. <laughs> yeah. Hand up. When you said 10 doors, I was like, mm. <laughs> Hand up. <laughs> Wouldn't let a DA lapse <laughs> from the pool. Whoops. So, but you look at it and you go, you know, so what's the risk involved? I'm not going to make money. How do I learn to make money? Well, I either read a book, I get some education, I get a project manager in, I get some expertise somehow, that will reduce my risk. But the characteristics that they have, they have to be detectives. So you have to be able to do that research. You have to find the property and find the suburb. You have to absolutely be a project manager, even if you outsource the project management, because you need to know the timeline and what's going on. You, I think you have to be a solution-based person. So here's one of my mistakes I'm going to share with you. Mm. You get into the renovation and your headspace is in the renovation and you don't step out and look at you know, the big picture. So Plumber came to us in the middle of a renovation of a property in the eastern suburb of Sydney and said, you know that toilet in the back laundry? It goes to ground. There's no sewage Ooh. attached to it. I'm like, oh my God, got to get airplane. the sewage. Rip up the concrete path, lay the sewage, eight grand later, wasn't in the budget, had to let things go out of the budget for that to happen. And we had the second toilet. Now what I should have done was step back and go, do I need a second toilet? And the answer was no. You know, because you, you're solution based. So you need to be solution based because every single day in renovation, it's like we put up the tiles when we found this problem with floorboards. What do you think? And so you're always thinking through, but you have to have the ability to also step back to the big picture and go, how does this get me to that end value? Hmm. Because if you're doing structural changes, it's not the bang for the buck of your dollars. Hmm. So I, I would say that they were the things that I think are characteristic of a very successful renovator. Okay, so again, some terrific stuff there. I love it when she says, if the profit's not in it, don't do it. It's pretty straightforward. It is, but <laughs> it's all about the numbers. Once mm. again, we hear this, you know, start with the end value, the end goal in mind, what it is, a clear on strategy before you buy, mm. different types of strategies, you know, buy to hold, 
flip. So it, it is all about planning out what you want to do and then executing on that. Because you heard it say, if you don't have a budget, mm. well, what's going to happen? Mm. You're not going to hold yourself accountable, are you? And don't put your owner occupier hat on when you're doing a renovation. Yeah, double double shower, uh, double head shower. That's for your owner occupier, not for your uh, not for your renovation. And interesting, she um, reminded us if you if you're going to do flipping, your target market's the owner occupier. Yeah, so it's it's really really important. And she talked about percentages there. So that's about doing the numbers in terms of what you should spend for the type of return that you're looking for. So. Jane, she is terrific. Jane's a good egg. We love Jane. She's yes. very much a friend of the couch. So, uh, and as is uh, Damien Collins. Yes, um, mate. If, if this bloke would be perfect if he wasn't a Collingwood supporter because he's from Perth. He's a he terrific loves property. bloke. He's a and, yeah. and what makes him a genius is mm. he's, he barracks for the black and white. Yeah, yeah, that's the point. So yeah, that's the point. He's there we the, go. The wealth of knowledge, the experience he has, the people around him, the collaborative understanding, the insights he's got on a tough market. He's a big fish over in that Perth pond over there. So let's listen to Damien and uh, see what nuggets uh, we can mine from him. No, exactly. I mean, it's it's you want to buy certainly at uh, the best opportune time, but no one can exactly predict no. the bottom. No. And so again, if you've got that long term horizon, you're not looking at what's happening next month or next quarter. Yeah. It's the next uh, 5, 10, 15 years, then buying counter cyclically is the smartest thing. But most people don't do that then, as you know. They, no, uh, they don't. Uh, when, the, when the rush is on and when it's in the front page of the paper, that's when most people come into the market. And we particularly saw that in, in, the, in the West and the Pilbara. Yeah. I remember very clear. We didn't buy properties up there for clients. We just knew it was overheated. And, uh, yeah. and unfortunately, it was a really sad bloodbath up there. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember so many questions in 2009, 10, 11, even 12, should I buy in the Pilbara? And we said, no, it's overheated, overcooked, don't do yeah. it. Uh, a lot of East Coast investors went in there thinking 2,000 or 3,000 a week rent was sustainable, uh, you know, paying 1.2, 1.3 million dollars for properties, and now they're worth <coughs> three and 400,000. It's Ouch. it's a lot of pain and a lot of people. And we've yeah. had people have come to see us subsequent to that, uh, yeah. who've we you know, and again cross collateralise their loans. It's a mess. They can't do anything. Um, they yeah, can't we're the sell. same. Yeah. So the reality is, there's no, there's not enough equity yep. there to uncross it and get rid of, or yeah. you know. Yeah. It's just a horror story. So yeah, just you just don't want to buy at the top, and yep. uh, sadly, most people that's the way they go. I, I guess I, I feel sad for the client, but mm. also annoy me are uh, the ones where they've uh, they've been led by clubs, groups uh, that are really masquerading as uh, educators. Yep, educators <laughs> and helping hel helping clients yeah, build oh, wealth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've seen some horror ones, particularly on the Gold Coast, where people who bought in at four fifty, four eighty, and you know we. Again, all crossed, everything's all tied together. Um, we do revaluations um, to get them financed and they're coming at 330, 340. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's sad because people have put their faith and trust in someone who's, yeah. who's meant to be helping them. And well, unfortunately, uh, Perth can be vulnerable that too because it's, you know, it's, the East Coast is um, often sort of the bigger brother um, yeah. to the, for the Perth paradigm and they come and rent a, you know, one of the nice um, hotels and they come over with some, you know, selling the dream of the Gold Coast. Because if you're in Perth, you, you don't grow up going to the Gold Coast on holiday, you go to Bali. Mm. So mm. the Gold Coast is quite foreign to Perth people, not, not so much now with low cost air, um, airlines, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, back, back in, in the, the early 2000s it was. So they, they are potentially really vulnerable because they've got all these huge incomes from the mining space. They've got the big brother coming home saying how great it is and you're obviously seeing it day to day in the business. Yeah, we have. And uh, most, look, if people have bought good solid investment properties, even though the Perth market's down about six or so percent over the last couple of years, uh, most of them have held their own or come back a little bit. Uh, it's it's where people have gone and bought into regional towns, gold, uh, or mining towns, mm. I should say, yeah. or been led astray by overinflated property on, you know, generally on the Gold Coast. Um, we've even seen a bit of it, Melbourne apartments, mm. they've, they've sort of uh, been yeah. targeting, uh, particularly as the market here's dried up, they've yeah. the last six months targeting over there. So uh, they're, the, they're the ones that I've, I've seen where people have gone, um, gone, uh, made the worst decisions and, and gone, got themselves into difficulty. And uh, it's tough when you've got negative equity, uh, you can't get them out of it. It's mm. very, very difficult. Mm. Through chats off air, we know the principles that you employ, but for the benefit of the listeners and the viewers, what, what are some of the fundamentals that you want to cover if a client's coming to you, getting advice uh, around building a portfolio or buying investment property or, or a combination of both. Are there, some, are there some principles or fundamentals that you stick to that, um, uh, that you talk to your clients each and every time? 
Well, Bryce, the first thing we, we do is, is a fact find, find out about the client. That's the first thing you've got to do because uh, uh, you know, people have different risk tolerances, different life circumstances, a whole raft of things. So people come and say to me, oh, what's the best property to buy? And I say, well, I don't know enough about you. Yeah. It says there's a right property for you, but that might not be right for somebody else. So it's really about finding out you know, where they're at in their journey, their risk tolerances, what their future plans are. Now, we know we all can't plan. We can say we're going to have kids in two years. That may or may not, all those sort yeah. of things. But yeah. what's their future plans? And and trying to be, uh, I guess, um, you know, conservative within that. We don't wanna, I don't want to ever get a situation where uh, a client's uh, uh, unable to afford a property. So if, yeah. you know, if, if they want to be pushing aggressively on servicing, I'll we'll say, well, look, you really want to fix your rates then. So you're locked in at least for the next three to five years. And yeah. so don't think rates will probably go up, but just in case you lock that in, that side yeah. of it. And you've got your income protection insurance. So if something happens in your job or, or you, you've got, uh, you get injured, you, at least you can keep making those payments. So mm-hmm. it's really about develop, developing, understanding the client, developing the right strategy and putting protections around them. We can't, again, guarantee the future, but putting as many protections in place as we possibly can so that uh, uh, if things go a little bit astray, the client's still safe and doesn't. Last thing you want is forced selling. That's the, you don't want to have to get to people to where they get, have to force sell. Totally. Yeah, very good there. So in terms of, um, so that's in terms of uh, advising, what about you as a property investor? You're about to go into the market this weekend and you're going to buy another property for your portfolio. What are some of the principles that you stick to when selecting assets, building your portfolio, getting your loan structure? Is there one or two or three that you'd want to share with the listeners? Well, certainly the loan structure, I'll touch on that one first. I do not cross-collateralise anything. Mm. Every one of my loans, all my investment properties is standalone. So yep. uh, I just don't want to put that together with um, another, so another bank is, can, has got control of my assets. So yep. I do have it quite Good spread advice. around. And uh, that gives you flexibility too to target uh, when properties have, uh, you know, if you've had one that's gone down and mm-hmm. one's gone up, if you're looking to get extra cash out, you just get the reval on the one that's gone up. When yep. they're crossed, you've got to get them all revalled. So never cross collateralise um, is my recommendation. Good so if advice, I'm, if I'm yep. going to buy a, a property, um, I'm looking again in those areas that what's what's going to change? So what is it, what, I'm trying to envision it, what's it going to be like in five, ten years time? And not what it is necessarily now, because that's where you can get those hidden gems where, okay, not everybody's buying here, and people don't realise the story, but we know in 10 years' time, on ABS stats, Perth's going to be at least half a million bigger than it is now, mm-hmm. so more congested. Um, people are going to value that transport uh, and, and all those sorts of things. I, I guess when it comes down then to the property itself, uh, it's got to be something that's rentable and, uh, and, and again, different market. Three bed, one bath in some areas, perfectly fine. In other areas, not. So mm. you've got to make sure it's that, that it suits the market in that particular mm. area. And uh, and then really then I go down and say, well, what's the land value here? Because ultimately, in 30, 40 years or whatever that time period, that building's going to be most likely, you know, particularly unless they've got character, which you do get more of in Melbourne, most likely that, that house is going to be ready for rubble uh, and it's not going to be worth much. So what is, what's, what's the land component value? We always aim for a minimum 50%. I prefer 70 but uh, but minimum 50% of the value of what I'm buying is in the underlying land. And that way, at least, you know, for a, we get clients who are a bit more cash conscious and uh, it's the old trade-off. If you've got something with a higher land value, less value in the building, the rental return's probably going to be less. Mm. And, uh, and so need more negative cash flow. For clients who are more um, cash concerned and cash constrained, we'll, we'll still get them something that's maybe a bit newer, not, not necessarily brand new, probably maybe 10-year-old villa or townhouse. And so you will buy sort of medium density sort of um, boutique townhouses, boutique sort of old style flats rather than the new apartment? You, you're happy to Oh, buy definitely, it? definitely. Yeah. yeah. Again, even the, with the apartment ones, we still do an underlying what's the implied land value. And a lot of apartments, mm, yeah. particularly in established areas, uh, can have more than 50%. Uh, not new ones generally, we, we steer clear of the brand new ones, but mm. uh, you know, certainly the older style ones that were built in the 70s and 80s in boutique complexes, yeah, yep. definitely. They've got good inherent land value. There's not a lot of supply of them around in those areas that they can make good investments for sure. Damien, 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 so much great knowledge, so much great insights. Where do I start? I mean, mining town troubles, Mm. he saw it happening. Everyone else was flavor of the month over there. He kept his clients away from that smartest decision. Remember, if you're going to buy in any regional location, you gotta pass the lifestyle test. Mm. If the people have gotta be attracted to it to wanna stay there and stay there, Big, you know, spruikers, be careful, mm. classic stuff in there. And I mean, for me, I also love this last bit about, you know, it's, it's a big buzzword called KYC at the moment. It's called know your customer. Mm. Well, start with the fact find. And he's pretty simple, isn't he? Planning and strategy before mm. you start. Mm. No, yeah. Just plan and strategize before you start. 
Yeah, absolutely. Throwing some good uh, some good finance lessons there to make sure they stand alone, no cross collateralisation. And the important thing for um, Damien, given that it's a boom bust town of Perth, he stayed true to the fundamentals. Didn't get seduced to putting mm. his clients into some of those flavour of the months. Mm-hmm. And now at the time, you know, there's 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 always the um, uh, there's always the enticement to do that. But now he's sitting pretty. His clients have got good fundamental properties, and we can learn a lot um, from what he shared in that. So. Good gold. Land value. There's another little tip. Mm. Likes to see it around 50%. Ooh. There we are. Well so up. well done. Well picked up. Thanks, Damo, for sharing that great, great information to our listeners. Ah, very true there. Okay, so my other partner in crime, Veronica. Yes. We got her on the couch. And um, I hadn't seen her for a little while. This was back in uh, the 11th of August, 2016. We hadn't seen each other, so it was a good chance for us to catch up. Is that that LLLLLA show? Most syllables in television history. Count them. Location. 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 I think there's 13. Australia. So, yeah, no. So it was good to have her on the couch. Um, she was obviously um, experiencing the Switched Sydney on boom. agent. Yep. Uh, so we asked for a few questions about building a property portfolio after the boom. And here is some of the gold that Veronica delivered right here, Ben, on the property couch. Veronica, the, um, you're a property investor as well. And this yes. uh, podcast is largely about giving the insider's guide to property investing. If you're about <laughs> to go and buy a property this weekend to add into your portfolio, there are some rough frameworks that you like to work with. New versus old, cities, um, yep. regional, that sort of thing. There's a guiding philosophy or guiding principle in my business and in the way that I invest myself is that yep. capital growth is king. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just, there, you're not going to get rich on extra $100 a week rent. Mm-hmm. Um, even if you got extra yield, if you think about the interest that you repay over the life of a loan, you know, people aren't even thinking about covering that really mm. when they're just looking at pos- positive cash flow, for instance. Um, so capital growth is the lowest risk way to go into property and Mm -hmm. obviously if you want to take risk when you've got a really solid portfolio then that's a different conversation Mm -hmm. but for most people who only buy one investment capital growth in my view has to be king which means that I avoid buying in risky areas where or even areas where you're only buying because it's affordable Mm. Because affordability, yeah. when it comes to property investment, if, equates risk. So um, I think that, you know, I've got a bit of a bugbear that I think a lot of the people that are investing in property, they're doing it on a false belief. Mm. And it's really scary. And I think it's really tragic, the amount of people that are really getting lured into something that's not actually going to deliver what they hope it will. Have you seen any scenarios in Sydney where, you know, there was, there was that FOMO, that fear of missing mm. out, where everyone, instead of just buying investment grade properties, they just put investment stock and they just put their name on a title. And now as that boom sort of starts to go back to equilibrium, are you seeing people come into you sort of with that sort of white knuckle or anxiety feeling that they might have bought off the plan or something mm. that you'd consider inferior? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, friends, people get whipped into a frenzy and it's, it's people are sheep. You know, mm-hmm. and they all do what everybody else is doing and they think, well, someone said did it, so it must be a good idea. And there's this thing called social social proof, mm. you know, and um, they don't coin terms like that because it doesn't ever happen. You know, the stereotype yeah. is a stereotype because most people are like that. And so when you look at southwest Sydney, for instance, the, the suburb where the clearance rates dropped plummeted in some suburbs under 50%. You know, the inner west, the eastern suburbs were still sitting in in the 70s. You know, when you see that difference and that, you know, it's those areas that go up and go down. Mm. That's, they're the areas where a lot of these people are, you know, the the, um, uninitiated, if you like, and the hopeful are going out, flocking out there and buying and they're the ones freaking out. And even, but I think what people don't realise is you get a blue chip area or green chip area and you can buy a lemon property within those areas. Yes. Mm. And uh, and this is the thing that people think, oh, you know, my office is in Balmain and I buy in Balmain, I can't go wrong. Well, yes, you can. Mm. And I can, it doesn't take me long to find some examples of how you can go wrong. Yeah. Um, so so do, you, do you subscribe to the theory that, because um, you're Balmain, Roselle, Lilida, all those sort of inner western sort of harbour um, suburbs, wouldn't it be better to buy, I'm definitely not a dog, in Balmain, but wouldn't it be better to buy an, an average property in Balmain um, than a really good property further out? Do you subscribe to the, the location doing um, most of the, most of the legwork? Mm. Yeah. 
I do. I've got to put a caveat on that, though. I really don't think you should buy a dog anywhere, mm. really. Agreed. So, But yeah. what about if you're buying a, you know, you're better off getting a B property in Balmain than an A property in a C suburb? Yes, yep. I think so, yep. yeah. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, what I notice as well is over time, a good quality property in a good quality area will... Um, always have demand regardless of market conditions. So they're effectively uh, immune to, to the market cycle. Mm. Which So if you're going in, out to C-grade areas or f- the further out you go from the epicentre effectively, you've got these peaks and troughs. Mm. So, you know, good market knowledge, understanding what, what, what properties and what suburbs are going to grow and the infrastructure and all the things that we're looking for yeah. is one thing. But then you've got to sort of make sure that you buy at or close to the trough and reading the market is, you know, very, very challenging. Yeah, the timing the market And call. don't buy at the peak. And a lot of these, you know, mining boom, mm. well, poor people have basically mm. lost their yeah, yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah. You know, they've followed the they've followed the masses and they've gone and bought at the peak. Mm. Um, and that's the big problem with a lot of these areas that aren't, you know, part of inner Sydney or inner Melbourne. So the the, the, the um, Balmain story you were just mentioning before, when you said it's not hard for you to find some of the underperformers, mm. can you do you summarise that in in terms of has it been medium and high density stuff that that's caused most of the pain there? No. Or what, what what other observations have you had in that market? Look, we really um, pull away from from new and yep. and recent and and very high density, so we, yep. we pull away from that. Yep. But like any rule, there's an exception to a rule, and there are some buildings and some complexes that. Do extraordinarily well but they've got history yep they've got history they're established um, and we will buy in certain ones and we, we know which buildings and which so is that character um, factory conversion type or high ceiling models as opposed to that sort of Lego land stuff some time but weirdly yep. enough it really depends you know okay so a building gets built yep. you know a bunch of investors these days Chinese investors buy it um, then it takes, I don't know, five, ten years before the resales start happening. The investors start selling out and the owner-occupiers start moving in. That's when you start seeing, forgetting the building quality, if yeah. it's a crap building, yeah, it's yeah, a crap it's, building. Yeah. But that's when you start seeing whether there's going to be a community developed there and whether it's going to be ongoing buyer appeal and owner-occupier appeal. appeal. Yeah. And so those buildings where that personality has started developing, mm. and some of these aren't particularly amazing, um, you know, architecturally Locks. or... Okay. Mm. Um, it's just something about them and some magic for whatever reason means that there's a community that has developed there and there's a certain demand and appeal about that particular development. And so we see a number of those, a lot of in the eastern suburbs, for instance, where yep. that's the case. So aspect, walk score, those types of things as well, they have to be... All of that. But, you yeah. know, within those buildings yeah. or within those complexes, there's still a very small percentage that we would recommend anyone yeah. buy because okay. yep. the floor plan's got to be good. Yep. The aspect has got to be away from the main roads, yep. you know what I mean? So there's quite a lot of, um, yeah, okay. of other caveats. Yeah. So following on from that, have you got a, um, a, a theory about apartments for investors? Are there two types of apartments? in your view and if so what are they? Well yeah they've got the high density brand new or, or recently built we don't touch with a barge pole. Yep. Um, so yes there's there's that and and we don't know what they're going to be like in the future you know I mean as in Melbourne mm-hmm. there are sections of Sydney which are massively overdeveloped yep. and full of renters or empty even you know when you've got mm-hmm. um, a lot of Chinese investors yeah. for instance they're, they're just parking their money. Parking they money. don't care if it's rented or not. So yep. we, we, you know you don't want to be in that sort of mm-hmm. um, in mm-hmm. that sort of development or that area so what we do look at uh, is existing stock and with a history mm-hmm. yep. so that you can actually look at and measure the best predictor of the future is the past. And yep. so yep. we are looking for that sort of thing. The, you know, the walkability scores and all those, the, it's lifestyle. And you think about European cities, for instance, you know, and people, my sister lives in Italy and she's got two two boys and everybody lives in apartments. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very, and if you live in a house, it's on the outskirts. And so there's the idea of living in the centre versus living on the outskirts. And, and that's, you know, obviously Sydney's a modern city. It's got yeah. different, there's no charm necessarily in the inner city, but it, this commuting time and also Sydney's got terrible infrastructure mm-hmm. as we all know mm-hmm. um, so you know the, the traffic is appalling most of, most of the day most most days of the week um, you know the, the public transport is fine mm. if you live in certain directions but in terms of crossing the city it's it's awkward yep. um, people are choosing to actually spend less time commuting and so therefore that lends itself to people 
agreeing to live in smaller properties with children even and so yeah. there's a different move and if you look about you know the 60s or say the 70s when you know the idea of getting out of the city and getting your your quarter acre block and your house in the burbs that was no appealing traffic, no congestion mm. yeah. yeah it was easy oh but but that was a sign of you're done Success. all right yes. poor people yeah. were in the city yeah you know, yeah and you know, yeah. e. h holden and you drove out there life Absolutely. was good absolutely yeah. Very true. Yeah, it's changed. I'm a lot younger than you two. I wouldn't remember those memories. Oh, so there yeah. we go. Well, there you go. She's um, she's a wonderful thinker around property. Ben, I've uh, travelled on many a plane, on many um, many a car with uh, Veronica all around this country, and I never get sick of hearing what she thinks about uh, property. Now she's a big believer. Capital growth is king. Mm. So you know. You, your extra hundred dollars a week is not going to make you wealthy. Mm. Um, it's obviously the growth story there. You know, we covered off going back. You know, this is August. It still had a bit of a sort of a flick in the tail, didn't it? The old Sydney market. Yeah, so, yeah, quite so a while. it kept moving along. But she, you know, she talked about the FOMO, and what I got out of that was a bit of changing times. You right. know, moving out of the city as opposed to the congestion and all that has led us closer in. And Sydney obviously is our most populated and densely populated city. So. I think there is a big story around closer in and still you get a quality property with owner occupier appeal. What did she say? It works in all markets mm -hmm. all the time. Yep. So there you go. She's a uh, she's a successful property investor herself too. So um, good stuff, Veronica. So if you want to listen to any, uh, if you want to go and study those uh, tips a bit more, Jane Slacksmith was episode 61. Damien Collins was episode 73. And Veronica was episode 76. So, Ben, our next one. Next one is Stuart Weems. Mm. So, Stuart, uh, you know, his commentary, his books. He's a good thinker. He's a good thinker. He's a thought leader. Yeah. I really like uh, where Stuart is and sticks to the fundamentals, though. Mm. Doesn't complicate no. it, but really is a, a fantastic um, sort of communicator when it comes to both the verbal and the written word. Um, that's why we're a big fan of his. All right, let's hear what Stuart had to say. I guess, Ben, we share the same sort of ethos there in terms of there's a lot of people that need help mm. and it's not that difficult. You know, investing and making money isn't that difficult. The industry, I think, makes it a lot more, not us, but mm. the industry as a whole makes it a lot more complex than it needs to be because yep. um, complexity creates dependency yep. and revenue. But uh, I don't think it needs to be that way. Yeah, great. Mm. Yeah. I think property is simple but not easy. And I mm. think largely it's not easy because we've got to get around our own head stuff. But the mechanics of um, building a portfolio of property and um, structuring the lending, let's be honest, it, it's actually quite straightforward. But it's about having someone who can guide you through that path and also make sure you stick to the path without being susceptible to, you know, changing wherever the breeze is going is, is the tough bit. So it's the upstairs. So that's why I always say it's very simple, but it's certainly not easy. Yeah. It's and I want to touch base on the um, financial planning comments as well. I don't know how many times I've had people come in, you know, having a meeting with us and said, I actually went and spoke with the financial planner, but I was really underwhelmed. You know, it was, it was just, I felt like it was all about trying to sell me something. Um, and you know, ultimately, there, a lot of these network and dealer groups are aligned, and they've got certain types of products that they're that they're offering and solutions around that. So, for me, this is the eye opener for that independent advice, that fee for service approach. And I think you, you know, I think you, I agree that the world is moving to that. And I think financial planners, you can go and see a really great one, um, which I think are pretty rare as well, mm -hmm. or you can see the run of the mill one. You know, and I say that about GPs as well. You can have a really great GP, and you can really have a shocking one as well. And you can you can be overwhelmed by the different messages. You know, a lot of people go in and say, "Oh, this person's selling me this person, selling me this, and this person selling me this." So I still think it comes down to trust and yeah. having that relationship and that connection. Most people don't find it difficult to use their accountant, do they? No. Um, and so my view is just remove the conflict of interest. If yeah. you remove the conflict of interest, then all you're left with is a client and a professional, and then the client just has to assess, does the professional have enough experience and knowledge? Do I enjoy working with them, and are they smart enough to help me solve my problems? Um, if you read the, pick up the paper and read the horror stories about financial planning, almost always, 99% of the time, it's because there's a conflict of interest. Yeah. Mm. So I think that's, if, if there's one bit of advice for Gold. people out there, yeah, it's just remove the conflict. Yeah. And then, then you, you know, if you feel like the person's an idiot on the other side of the table, walk away. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, if you remove the conflict, typically the professionals then that are attracted to 
a situation like that typically have a bit of nows and yeah. and knowledge. And it's that and tailored so solution, it. isn't it? It's not that yeah. off the shelf solution. No. So it not only happens in financial services, but it also happens in the property space. Yeah. And obviously, part of the work we do with Pippa and you know is to if there is commissions payable, and yes, some of our members do uh, claim commissions because that has been the traditional business model for, for marketeers and people who do do sell a stock lists. And from that point of view, that's great, as long as they disclose. Yeah. You know, and then the client can make an informed decision around that. You know, you, obviously you and I have gone down the fee-for-service path, but ultimately that's what it, that's what it looks like. So I think yeah. that's a good point. I think yeah. it's a really good tip. Remove the conflict of interest because yeah. then you feel like you're getting um, genuine relationship and trusted advice status. So yeah, very good tip. Well, what are some of the, the sort of big light bulb moments along that journey? So what were some of the, the lessons around strategy and execution that you learned as you're building out that story? Probably the, you know, if I look back, I've um, been doing this 14 years now. So if I look back, what are the key key lessons I've learned? And one of the, one of um, one thing I've learned from, I've got a mentor that's in his mid-70s mm-hmm. and he's, he's run a, a massively successful accounting business. And it's ironic that he thinks longer terms than I do, and he's in his, he's, he's 70, <laughs> 75, 76, I'm 41. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so one of the, you know, one of the things that I've learned to, probably more particularly over the last few years, is just think long term. Yeah. Business, perspective, investing, and also in my, in my personal life. So what can I do today so that in 20 years, my life's better, yeah. my, I've got more money or more flexibility, more opportunity. Ben, ben, ben heckled me a couple of weeks ago, but someone's sitting in the shade now because they planted a seed many, many years before. And so, uh, I know, only heckle because it's a classic sort of you know, <laughs> analogy, that's all. Yeah, yeah. but that's, a, that's essentially but it's what it is. You've yeah. got to make a decision uh, at some point to yep. look after what's going to happen a bit further. Yeah. And, further and you know, I think in long term reduces the anxiety created uh, by worrying about short term market mm, movements. Yeah. A- yeah. And um, I know Chris Gray was uh, yeah. on the podcast and said the same sort of thing I'll buy the property in 30 years and you know, I'll worry about it. And we actually refer our clients to Chris behind you yeah, yeah. in Sydney. So, uh, but I, I 100% agree. You know, just yep. just think about what you can invest in today, or how you can allocate your cash flow today. Yep. So that who knows what's going to happen in the next couple of years? No one really does. Let's yep. you know. Let's be honest. No one's um, got a, a crystal ball. But we, but we, but it's a lot easier to work out what's going to work over 10, 20, 30 years. Very true. You know what? This, I, I wrote a vision for the mortgage broking industry about five years ago. And the vision was that we were about, mortgage brokers were about 42, 43% of the market at that point. And my vision, and we stagnated at that point for a long period of time, probably mm. the previous five years were about that yep. level. And so I wrote a vision for the mortgage broking industry. And the idea was that we get above 50% market share. And the only way that we could probably, or the way that I foresaw saw that we could do that mm. was to really become the trusted advisor as opposed to the transaction facilitator. And I think mortgage brokers have a massive opportunity in Australia because I think uh, financial planners have probably done a lot of damage to their brand. Not I think, they probably they have. Yeah. They've done a massive yeah. amount of damage to their brand. And many clients, we all know this, clients have a really bad impression of planners. Yep. Accountants have kind of missed the boat because they're too busy doing the compliance work and they're not really the right type of personality. Well, normally person they're focused to, on the tax as well. They're focused yep. and they're too short-term focused. Yep. You know, what's going to save tax next year? And most yep. of their work is spending what happened last year as well. They look at the rear the vision on, mirror rather than yeah, through the front uh, windscreen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's not a criticism, it's just... Yeah. Industry default. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what they're trying to do. Yeah. 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 Whereas mortgage brokers, you can't sell someone a mortgage if you don't need one. You know, you're either buying a house, a home, or you've got some equity in your property, or at least then you can have a discussion about building wealth. Now, obviously, the the consequence of having that discussion is maybe you'll take out another mortgage. So, mm-hmm. of course, there's a reason for the conversation, but they don't have anything to sell you. You know, when it comes to property, a lot, there's some mortgage brokers out there that will go and link up with the developer and be very aware of those yeah, people. Yeah, be careful, be careful. But, but a really good mortgage broker will know where the separation is. For myself, I'm a financial services expert. I'm not a property expert. I know plenty about property, but I never operate in that space and I'd refer out. Go and um, find yourself a, a good buyer's agent and so mm. forth. Yep. But a mortgage broker can can really occupy that role where there's very little in terms of conflict of interest, but there's a great knowledge base there and experience. I couldn't agree with you more. And I remember writing to you once I saw you that, that uh, a release that you did. Yeah. And I was I think there's a, a massive opportunity there for mortgage brokers to be household money managers. 
you know, because most of the time financial planners, oh, there's a surplus there, great, we're going to set you up in a managed fund or whatever. So my view, and since the regulations come in where mortgage brokers are now licensed and they've got to give appropriate advice, they are in control of credit. And so they should be in control of the family budget. So a great mortgage broker should be someone who's really focusing in on cash flow and understanding that cash flow story to then take the household on a journey and to then you know adapt to helping the, the household manage their money in a more efficient way, but also then putting that surplus to work, which is really where we create wealth. Ben, investing is not that difficult, according to Stuart, and we tend to agree it's simple, but it certainly is not easy. Well, it's not easy, but the principles are kiss, aren't they? Keep it simple, stupid. Mm. Like, just make it, don't complicate it, overcomplicate it. It does come down to the fundamentals. We talk about A, B, C, D, getting those right. I love the, the notion of the conflict. Take the conflict out. You know, if there's a conflict of interest, and there's inherent conflicts in everything, because ultimately we get paid a fee for the work that we do, potentially. But what are you looking for? Well, Fee for service is probably a good way to go. Mm. Yeah, yep, absolutely. In terms of what that looks like. And um, how's your little sneak in a little bit of gold there? Your mortgage broker should be the household cash flow manager. Yes. Never a true word has been said. Trusted advisor, money management. We've got some more exciting stuff to talk about. I don't want to give it away, but you know what I'm like? <laughs> oh, there's <laughs> some big things in 2018. No, come There on. is some massive things that are going to happen for the Property Couch listeners in 2018. So... Watch this space. Watch this space. And if you want to find out about all those sorts of things, go to thepropertycouch.com.au, download our money smart system. Just makes good sense to get that just on its own, Ben. But then we can keep you up to date Mm -hmm. on all these things that you've been talking about. God, he loves to play the long game like the rest of us. Yes. So there's another, you know, every get success leaves clues. Success leaves clues. All right. So for the final one for today um, is the good doctor. The good doctor. Dr. Andrew Wilson, and we we had him on the couch, Ben, at the Sydney Property Expo. It was, we did. It was wonderful. Loved the chat, didn't he? He, 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 he rivals can, you. He can talk. He the rivals boy, you. Thank you. I take that as a compliment. Yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah, he knows his stuff, basically. He does stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. All right. Um, without any further ado, Ivis, hit the button. Andrew. Uh, we should open the batting by why yeah. are you so optimistic with the Australian property outlook? Well, we only have to look at history, really, Bryce, to see that, um, I mean, history shows us what a uh, resilient and robust investment uh, vehicle residential property is. And uh, uh, and it's not just a question of economics. It's, it's also a question of, um, our, I guess, inner connection to property investment. And as I frequently say, that uh, if we think about our backgrounds, that most of us come from Uh, Anglo-Saxon or Southern European or East Asian cultures originally and um, I think that uh, we always have that sense of the sanctity of of bricks and mortar investment and I guess it always becomes a cliche when we we think of those terminologies such as bricks and mortar, the safest houses. Uh, When I do, um, and I do occasionally, debates with uh, our fraternity from the, uh, the share market. <laughs> Seen a few of those. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's all good, love them, you know, but they have their role. You know, and when we sort of say about these truisms that reflect property investments, such as safest houses or bricks and mortar, we don't sort of get the same sort of vibe when we say safe as stocks and shares or, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I think that does reflect that we have this inner connection to the sense that, uh, that bricks and mortar investment does have that robust, resilient, and, and solid longer term um, outlook and, and, and uh, results. And, and I think that that does, again, reflect that cultural the sense that we have that owning property and investing in property uh, really is, uh, you know, from our backgrounds, almost a, a guaranteed roadway to, to prosperity and wealth. And I think that's part of what does drive investment in property, not just from owner occupiers, but particularly smaller scale investors in our markets. And this is the other point in terms of our future is uh, I think we're not just tapping into that underlying sense, that DNA connection to property investment, but we're also seeing that the the times are starting to favour property investment more and more. Uh, And I think Australians are are, are going to grow even to even higher levels of being small scale investors in property. And, And that's a result of how our economy is evolving and all the advantages that we do have uh, in terms of tax advantages, uh, particularly uh, in residential investment. And I think that we're seeing that now, 
uh, and particularly, of course, in the Sydney housing market, which is investor central, has been investor central for the last uh, four years and, and rising again. And I think that, um, you know, that we will continue to see that um, as, as a significant driver of our economy, our housing market and our investment choices. Are you concerned around the marketplace is going to overshoot itself? Do you think that at the end of this cycle we'll start to see some correction? I think what we're seeing in terms of the cycle will be a different cycle going forward. I think the, the volatility of the cycle is something that will become a factor of the past. And this is because our economy is changing. Hello, Australia. Join the real world. <laughs> I mean, we've had China driving us uh, a, a, a against the, the flow of economic uh, activity in other advanced economies for the last four years. Now, that's finished. Thank you, China. We appreciated it at the time. But all good things come to an end. And now we're transitioning back into uh, another type of economy. But we're, we're, you know, we're a hostage to international forces. And we are seeing downward pressure in interest rates. Our interest rates have fallen substantially over the last four years. It hasn't been just to uh, keep Sydney homeowners happy. It's been to try to reinvigorate and reinflate our economy in the face of the end of our uh, resources boom. And this is still a journey. I believe interest rates will continue to fall, but what we will see is a flattening of the economic cycle. And that means we'll see a flattening of the house price cycle. Um, but as I said originally, I think it will become more about local factors and local cycles rather than an overarching cycle. But make no mistake, the Sydney housing market is the long-term journey will be a higher proportion of investors through the cycle. And uh, you know, the Sydney market, in my opinion, certainly by 2030, we will have more property owners in units than in houses, so more units than houses. And I think by 2040, uh, we'll have more tenants, that is investors, than owner-occupiers in the Sydney market. Now, you might think that that's an extravagant uh, prediction, but we only have to look at New York to see exactly the same circumstance. I mean, Sydney is the New York of the Southern Hemisphere. Mm. Uh, New York has the highest price of any of the uh, American capital cities. It also has the lowest home ownership rate. Mm. And we are heading to low home ownership rates here. L yes, it's a tragedy for first home buyers. At the moment, we have just 4.8% of lending as we have nearly 60% for investors, we have just 4.8% of lending to first Thirsties. home buyers. That's near a record low. And folks, don't think this is going to recover anytime soon. To get first home buyers back into the market at the average levels of around 13%, the long-term average levels, we'd have to see Sydney house prices fall by around 30%. That is not going to happen, mm. believe me. Mm. So the future is that we are going to see higher levels of, uh, of uh, tenants, which means more investors and tenants will be renting for a longer period of time, maybe for life, which means that the Sydney market will become the same fertile environment for investors that the New York market is. And I'm you know, absolutely confident that this is our outlook. Mm. Do you, wh wh how do you see that impacting if there's a, there's a huge um, spotlight on Melbourne and Sydney? Yeah. On the other cities, as a, as a comparison, they, they seem quite undervalued, but they don't have the big um, multinationals to drive those six-figure incomes. So well, well, look, there's no doubt that you know, Melbourne and Sydney have, have moved clearly ahead of the pack in the cycle. I mean, real house prices have actually fallen in Hobart, Canberra, Perth, uh, Darwin um, and Adelaide. They've fallen since this cycle, uh, the previous peak of the cycle in 2010. Um, so there's been no real great surge in growth. And this shows you that it's not just about the lower interest rates improving affordability, it's about those local conditions. And more and more house price growth will reflect uh, local conditions rather than the interest rate differential, or the interest rate driver and that's why we've seen Sydney push ahead of other capital cities so strongly and as a result of more investors. But having said that, we are still seeing higher levels of investors in those capital city markets that are still underperforming. I mean, even the Perth market is attracting investors now. And this is the future. You go to your accountant or your financial advisor and they'll say to you, look, why don't you think about getting an investment property? You know, the yields, yeah, they're 4 or 5% but they're a lot better than you're going to get anywhere else. We can set up your tax position so that you can negatively gear. Uh, you will accrue capital gains. Look, they're not going to be double figure, perhaps, in Sydney 
as Sydney has gained over the last few years, but they'll still be those 3 or 4% growth through the cycle, which you can build on, and compared to the sort of returns you will get in other, uh, in other uh, investment instruments, uh, particularly you know, fixed, in uh, fixed income returns like cash deposits. Term deposits. They're term deposits they're gonna be now look, we talk about yield. Everybody say, oh, the, I hear analysts, analysts say that, oh my God, yields are so low. How could you possibly be interested in residential property with a 4% yield? What are you getting in the bank? Now look, I've got a model on my presentation which I ran which models the returns on the average, it's from the Reserve Bank, the average term deposit interest rate for a $10,000 fixed term over one year, or over one year term, right? Now that's currently at 2%, with yields, uh, the average Sydney yield for a dwelling at the moment is 4%. So there's that 2%, 4% differential. Now if you go back to the previous boom in the early 2000s, it was the other way around. Now we've got, this is the difference in our economy now. Because rates are so low, the point is that yields haven't fallen at the same rate as deposit rates have. They've actually held their own, right, whereas deposit rates have fallen away. Now we've got a 50% gap between what you get at that fixed term deposit in the bank as to what you get in a yield in Sydney, which has the lowest yields of all the capital city markets. This is why more and more investment decisions, and it becomes almost, you know, osmosis, I mean, intuitive, that you think, gee whiz, you know, uh, property investment, you know, I can still get capital growth, uh, but I get the, the tax advantages, negative gearing, uh, discount on my capital gains, uh, tax depreciation, um, and, and, you know, compared to this low growth, flat economic environment we have, it's just a no-brainer. And of course, we're also exposed to the stock market, most of us, through our superannuation. So it means we're diversifying. We've got our super reflecting the stock market and we have these portfolios that we can develop in residential investment. And believe me, uh, the government is not going to touch in a significant manner the tax advantages for, for small scale investment. So we see in, um, in the cycle too, because what we calculate... Oh, the doctor. <laughs> he should tell us what he really thinks. Oh, he, he, <laughs> when he gets into that zone, mm. you just sit back and you just listen. Take it all I mean, where do we go? Solid Thank you, China. Tender. How's that? Thank you, China. Thank you, China. Obviously, the mining boom. Yeah. Solid long-term outcomes. Safer. Bricks and, uh, safe as bricks and mortar or you know, safe as houses. You know, bricks and mortar solid. But I don't disagree with him. I think if you take a, you know, lift the eyes and 20 years, 30 years from now, He's right. Mm. You know, New York, London, Hong Kong, Sydney. Sydney. Could Sydney is the New York into Southern that. Hemisphere, he said. Yeah, so I think it is about looking at that long game, and I absolutely feel that there will be, you know, a few more landlords and more people. So big choices for people to make in terms of what they want that to look like, so where you're going to live. But, but it's a happening, vibe, vibrant city. Melbourne's very similar. So... I think there will be, they will be our two big knowledge mm. centres, mm. and then the other cities will be lifestyle centres potentially. But here he said the, uh, the different cycle going forward is planning, but there'll be local cycles. Mm. So you've got to better understand those lo local cycles um, with those higher proportion of investors in those bigger markets. So that was uh, the, the, the podcast was podcast number 87, Ben. It was the 27th of October 2016, mm. and we said, what's the future of this train and property market? So it's good to fast forward, listen to that little uh, excerpt, yep. Yep. and see that the principles still apply. It, and he's, yeah, he's not changing his longer term view. So you play the long game. Just be careful about oversupply in certain markets and how they all look. But ultimately, some good, fantastic fundamentals there, mate. So, oh, Pure Gold, episode a, number two of Pure Gold. That was, uh, that was our uh, part two of our best of for this summer series, Ben. Yeah. So, um, some real gold there. As we heard, Jane Slack-Smith, Damien Collins, Veronica Morgan, Stuart Weems, and of course, Dr. Andrew Wilson. All right, mate, my life hack today yes. is over to, I've been a, you know, I've been a user of Facebook for a little while, Ben. Have you? Um, and I probably, uh, I, I'm now the low um, uh, information diet that Tim Ferriss talks about in the four hour work week. I don't get into the news cycle very often. Yep. Um, his view and that is if anything major is happening, someone around the office will tell me and yep. I'll see a headline. And part of that is, I, I don't want to be distracted by a lot of things. So you know, I have to turn notifications yep. and everything off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I've done on Facebook is I've now qu um, quelled all the people that, so I've got two Facebook accounts, obviously yep. my professional one, which yep. I'll invite anyone to join me. Yep. And then on my personal one, I just want to keep that sphere close. My parents are in Perth. It's a good way to keep up with the kids. Yep. So 
that was a long intro into what I'm talking about here. On no, it's a good backstory. Uh, so now I've got Facebook feed largely around the groups that I want to get information from. Yep. Um, and then my core close family and friends. But quite often in those groups that I see, there's a lot of really good videos that I want to watch. But in the interest of not being distracted, I just I don't watch them. Mm. So I don't know if you know Ben on the in, in your Facebook feed. No, I um, didn't know on, this. This is on your mobile. Right at the at the at the top here is if you say you're looking in your feed. Right. And let's uh, I've got it on airplane mode here, so that just shows we're not that planned here. <laughs> if you if you go and have it, see this video that's coming through here. Yep. If I go those top little three little three dots, dots up there. Yeah. And I go save video. It just goes into my save video. So then down here, the uh, three little three lines dashes down the, down the bottom, bottom right. Yeah, yeah. I click on that, and then I go to uh, uh, my saved videos here, and then I can go and watch those. So to give you an example, Ben, and then I've got all the videos yeah, that I can yeah, watch. Yeah, I like it. Now to give you an example of how that works, is I, it's all about batching, right? Batching. So I want to watch yep. those videos, but yep. if I watch it now, I get distracted, I don't get any yep. work done, all that sort of stuff. Yep. So you and I got off the plane um, at the end of last year in Sydney. I got mm-hmm. the, you went your way in your cab. I went my way in my yep. cab. And to make that 35-minute um, ride, I just sat there and I opened my feed and I started watching all these saved videos. Oh. And it was a good use of my time. Yeah, so I like to batch. I'm, I'm doing a bit more batching with my podcast oh. where I get into a certain headspace about stuff that I want to learn. Yeah. And so I'll batch. Ooh. So rather than listening to one each week, I might batch three or four of them. And that's Love it. Yeah. Hey, mate. There we Birds go. of a feather. There we go. So that's my life hack for folks, the Facebookers. Three little dots at the top. Save those videos and watch them when you're waiting for a pizza, when you're in a line for a cab, when you're just sitting in the boarding lounge. Beautiful. Bang, you can... Uh, there we go. Productivity, productivity, productivity. Did you know? Did you know? So I thought we'd talk a little bit about inflation, Bryce. Ooh. You know, we haven't really done no. much about, you know, sort of definitions and be, so a bit of put me economics hat on. I'm, I'm just talk a little bit about... Hand, handwritten notes too, folks. A little this few is, uh, handwritten notes just yeah. to make sure, I, you know, I don't stuff it up. But effectively... No, 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 the point being that you're prepared. Well, true, but uh, I still will stuff it up, even if I'm... <laughs> actually, it's probably more likely that I'll stuff it up than I'm prepared. So what is inflation? So it's, it's really important to understand that inflation is a sustained increase in the general level of prices of goods and services in a country. Okay. And it's measured basically on an annualized basis. Makes sense. Okay. So you don't have too much inflation like we saw in Zimbabwe many, many, you know, a few years back where mm. it's, you know, it costs millions of dollars to buy a loaf of bread. That's just nuts. Mm. Right? Just doesn't make sense. But what causes inflation? So, you know, a lot of people might say, oh, just just prices going up, isn't it? Mm. But there's some technical way in which we look at that. So there's a thing called demand pull which is basically where the aggregate demand of goods and services rise more rapidly than product capacity can handle. Ooh. So if you think about it like that, you know what's, what's a good example of that? So when interest rates go down, as an example, um, and everyone can get access to maybe more money, yep. it puts pressure on supply, sorry, demand, it puts pressure on the supply, which potentially can lift the value because you can't produce enough of it. So that's, that's what's called demand pull mm-hmm. as a measure. Now, the other one is obviously, you know, in terms of supply or cost push, Ooh. right? So cost push, cost push, <laughs> cost push. <laughs> I was going to let that one go. <laughs> is where the cost of prices of, you know, of the production process increases. So if there's things that add value to the cost of manufacturing or building something, and they, you know, what's a good example? Electricity at the moment. Great example. Right? You know, when, when the, obviously... There's cost of electricity going through the roof and you need electricity to make your good or, you know, then naturally you've got to pass it on to keep your margin. Mm. So that's what we're talking about in terms of those types of pressures that put the value of goods higher. Ooh. Okay, so, it, you know, and in, in property sense, if you're constructing something, the cost of constructing that good into the future might be more. So it's actually good if you're in an asset that it has an inflationary element to it, like mm. a, a house, mm. is a perfect example of an asset that if you're holding, the inflationary value can be handy for you mm. in terms of replicating that. Mm. So, you know, the cost of replacing that can potentially lift the value at over time. So there you go, mate. Demand so, pull and cost push. I like yeah, it. Demand pull and cost push. Can I? That's can I? Can I go inflation. out on a limb and say I reckon from me on this side of the couch? Yeah. That's the best. Did oh, you know? 
you really? Yeah, man, I did. Yeah, he didn't like my Christmas one, that, you know, that Christmas Day wasn't actually Love. the real time that Jesus was born. Loved it. It was terrific. But that one there, <laughs> you can go to the bank on that one. Go to the bank on that one? Oh, obviously, you enjoyed that one, didn't you? Uh, so you Maybe I'll bring in a few more, like price elasticity, or I might do a few others in oh, terms of... Oh, did you know Series? Equal, we might, we might, yeah. Okay. We might bring out a few of the old economic definitions, just to help out those people who are new to sort of these concepts. Yeah, I love it. All right, well, um, I, I think it's fair to say there was a fair bit of gold on that, uh, did you know, that matched all the gold that was delivered from our wonderful guests. So we've obviously, through this summer series, we've highlighted some of the uh, guests that we've had on the first 100 episodes, Ben. Yes. Um, so terrific, um, terrific insights that they shared. But uh, We'll do this, I think we'll do this again. Yeah, see you next summer. I think that sounds like a plan. <laughs> next summer, yeah, I was just going because it takes a little while to produce. <laughs> That's all right. All right, so uh, terrific stuff, mate, but uh, until next week. Knowledge is empowering, Bryce, but only if you act on it. And 2018 is the year of action. <laughs> year of action. That's a little footnote to the old <laughs> title. Uh, but until next week, folks, see you later.